Welcome to Park Media. I'm your host today, Vince Emanuele, and we are joined by Paul Buell, who is a former senior lecturer at Brown University. He's an activist, longtime activist, and an author and editor of more than three dozen books, including Eugene V. Debs, Che, C.L.R. James, Red Rosa, Bohemians, Marxism in the United States, and many others. We are pleased to have him on for the program. Thanks for joining us, Paul. Happy to do it. Let's start. I wanted to use this interview to talk about your personal history. I had been searching online, looking at previous interviews of you, and there's a lot of you talking about your work, but not too much uh, sort of about your personal history. And I wanted to get into that a little bit today. So I know you were born in Champaign, Illinois in 1944. I'm wondering a little bit about what your childhood was like and if you came from a sort of a political home. Uh, if you know how how indeed did you get involved with politics as a young man? Uh, not unusually, I read in 1968 in New Left Notes, uh, written by a regional organizer in the Midwest. He wrote that it was not unusual for SDS activists in the Midwest to come from the home of liberal Republican professionals of some kind. Uh, and that suits me. My father was a, a geologist for the state of Illinois. He uh, would find water uh, through a, a machine that had been invented in the early 1950s, partly by himself, uh, uh, or rather find gravel uh, uh, pits in farmlands mostly, uh, and therefore, the, therefore there was a likelihood of being a, a potential well. Uh, and it was free to the citizens of the t- small towns and farms as service. My mother uh, was a, a nurse who had uh, been trained as a nurse and wished to be a social worker and was a social worker in uh, Manhattan in the 1930s and then uh, uh, lost the opportunity because she married my father and, and came to uh, Champaign to uh, be married and have children and so forth and so forth. But she was a, a frustrated uh, professional, and eventually she went back to work as a, as a nurse, as an RN, and uh, tried to get you know, a lifelong Republican. She tried to get other nurses interested in forming a union, and she was blacklisted from her uh, profession, more or less, uh, and suffered badly the, the rest of her life from uh, that very bad experience. Her great grand her grandfather. Let me start again here. Her great grandfather was. Are you are you hearing me? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Sure. Okay. Her great grandfather, my mother's great grandfather, was an abolitionist, oh, wow. uh, a farmer who uh, came from Maine to Illinois in the uh, early 1850s. Uh, went all the way to Missouri. Talked about uh, black rights. Was threatened with tar and feathering, and made his way across the Mississippi to Illinois. Wow. And. Uh, very likely was a a reader and supporter of Elijah Lovejoy, the abolitionist newspaper editor who was lynched by a a mob. At any rate, uh, this same uh, great-great-grandfather of mine, great-grandfather of hers, marched with Sherman through Georgia, which seems like a a very big family story for me. Came back and spent the rest of his life on a farm, but he lived long enough to uh, visit with my mother's family in the same region of uh, northwest Illinois, so the the memory of the the old abolitionist was very much there in my childhood, and I'm sure had a a role along with uh, imagined heroes of mine, which would emphatically include uh, Robin Hood, uh, William Tell, and uh, very likely um, uh, very likely in the near future uh, Harvey Kurtzman the founder and editor of Mad Comics. These are my big childhood heroes, along with Willie Mays, the phenomenal black baseball star center fielder of the New York Giants. Still one of the best catches of all time. So you... He, he, yeah, that's right. That's right. I, uh, on my adolescent wall, I had four 
photos, full pages from Sport Magazine of Willie Mays racing back in the 1954 World Series, making a basket catch at the wall in the polo grounds and hurling around and throwing a strike must be 405 feet to home plate. Uh, one of the most phenomenal actions of, a, of an athlete or a baseball player that, that one could possibly imagine. And I would say that that carried me forward, that image, uh, to uh, my experience at age 13 of taking a junior high school class with the only African-American uh, that taught in the Champaign school system, a, a staunch Republican county, a staunch Republican town, uh, but who uh, talked about civil rights and labor rights and so forth and made a, a very deep impression on me. And uh, now I'm 14 or 15 and paperbacks begin to appear in the, the drugstore that include Why We Can't Wait, by Martin Luther King Jr. and Listen Yankee by C. Wright Mills. And those things, along with socially critical science fiction paperbacks, same drugstore, uh, all 35 cents, made a, a, a big, big impact on me. And then comes the summer of 1961 when I'm walking around downtown, benighted, politically benighted Champaign, and there's a, suddenly a picket line against discrimination at, at a department store. And I jumped right in. Uh, and it was the most exciting day of my life since I'd uh, pitched a, a no-hitter in Little League. Uh, I saw a, 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 some kind of future in front of me, although it would take a, a while to get there. But I became a, a wild-eyed enthusiast for uh, civil rights in the only venue uh, open to me, a uh, Christian youth group in town. Uh, and they placed me on the city youth city council, uh, which was very disappointing to me. Uh, and I left early for college, fell in with a group of uh, more or less uh, beat characters who didn't realize the beat generation was over by 1962 and <laughs> uh, left with a, a beat Nick girl for San Francisco on a Greyhound bus in uh, June of 1963 found a someplace that looked as much unlike Champagne as any place in the world could possibly be. <laughs> uh, and after a while, uh, married the girl who became Mary Jo Buell, future MacArthur Award winner and a feminist scholar of note, and uh, learned about socialism for the first time from very odd sources. Uh, and then I was back to Champaign, and then we're uh, seeing the beginning of the, the anti-war movement. And uh, I was happy to jump in, and like so many other Protestant boys from uh, liberal Republican homes, I found myself as a, an orator, or at least as the person who would make the introductions, tell a joke or two, and then get off the stage as the main speakers uh, come to talk to the crowd. That, that seemed to be the role I would have for, for quite some time in my life, and I never quite gave it up until I stopped teaching. Let me uh, back up a little bit, Paul. So it's 1961. Sure. You're 17 years old. You're in Champaign. You see this action taking place at a local department store. You jump right into it. You get involved. What what did your did you go home and talk to your family about this? How were your friends and neighbors processing this in a place like Champaign? I don't think we get enough of these stories from places like this about wh how the civil rights movement played out. Good, it's it's a very good question. Uh, Champaign, although being Champaign Urbana, uh, a major college town in the Midwest, was one of the five most segregated cities in Illinois. Uh, the black population was sealed off. Uh, in the north side, and in my part of town, we, you know, really would scarcely see a non-white person until you got to campus, and then there was a quite a variegated population. Um, so my uh, family, uh, nominally uh, anti anti-racist or at least non-racist, there would be some people of color in the congregational church. But those are usually people from Africa and Asia, as opposed to African Americans from uh, uh, ten minutes away by car. Uh, and there was a, a certain sort of uneasiness, uh, which 
it struck me and it's just strange and curious and uncommitted and and so on uh and i became friends with uh, several uh, uh black guys including uh a saxophonist i, I learned 10 years later a gay saxophonist who would become a, a an md and we remain friends ever since he's a physician in in manhattan and visiting him uh in the north end some place i had never been as a child was uh, eye opening in the sense that it was the poorest part of town and eye opening in the sense that he described his life to me uh and uh it just in general it was a world unknown when the civil rights movement picked up a bit more it really didn't go very far but when it picked up there were major events in black churches uh, across town and i recall that at one of those events of maybe several hundred people in which there were a dozen white faces of which eight were probably uh, college professors and their students there, there there couldn't have been more than three or four students my age um i was invited by somebody to come to a, a sort of social a sunday social event of uh teenagers in uh, in the north end of champaign and so i went and i was surrounded by a dozen uh, young women they were wonderful and so polite and just great uh and quite beautiful too but i was so made so nervous it was something that was so far out of my experience that i just i had to get away fast i i could not get a a, a grip on this world being so different than mine and and when i was uh, on the champaign youth council and i realized after the first couple of meetings and there were some non-white uh, students my age that all they wanted to do at as they began anyway was to make a few gestures uh, uh, getting uh, mittens for poor children at christmas and that sort of thing that i became very enraged and uh insistent that something more could be done and that wasn't something that uh, that the, the leaders had the courage to take on or that the city was going to accept in any way whatsoever and and to this day uh, there's only one sort of neighborhood where uh, black uh, numbers of black people and white people live together and a neighborhood i was born into uh bordering on the uh the ghetto is now all black people those white people left town and in my middle class neighborhood we moved to when i was 6 uh really very little integration has taken place and people of color who live there feel isolated so uh as a an, an airport attendant from chicago once said to me when i came back to town to visit this is an okay place but they got to do something about those white people <laughs> uh and i think i feel the same way today my relatives who remained in town became uh, born again christians uh with extremely conservative views yeah my uh my family's all italian immigrants um came here at the beginning of the cent- beginning of the 20th century uh, all union folks all ended up in republic steel wisconsin steel on the south side of chicago yeah. everybody grew up in the 10th ward uh everybody was strong union democrats uh, and then within the last 20 years or so, we have, you know, now Trump supporters. Now there's guys who grew up on the south side of Chicago, moved to the suburbs, listen to Toby Keith, wear cowboy boots and drive fucking pickup trucks, which is just mind blowing to me. Um, yeah. 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 Th- that I, oh, go ahead, Paul. I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say it, it's heartbreaking, but uh, the experience in Wisconsin of blue collar communities across the state that voted for Obama twice they uh saw a nap to take away their jobs and they not in- inappropriately blamed the democrats in front of them for being enthusiastic supporters of of NAFTA and absolutely were not going to vote for Hillary Clinton no matter what she said or did that's right uh Same in and they didn't like being sent off to those wars either so uh obama as a peace candidate had also had a great appeal and then in 2016 those factories are all gone and people are embittered their newspapers shut down and uh what's accessible to them is fox news uh and hardly anything else and they uh they voted for trump now we don't know what will happen after that but there's something i left out which is to say in 2011 2012 
uh, I was delighted, uh, happy to be part of the Wisconsin uprising, in which some days we had uh, 150,000, 200,000 people on the streets of Madison uh, to protest uh, the new Governor Walker's right to work law and his stripping of, of, of union rights away. Uh, we were but, there. Uh, the movement failed despite all that energy. Uh, the Democratic Party was unable to rally people for uh, recall elections or to get themselves into the next election. And it left people perfectly flat, uh, in spite of the fact that the center of the struggle were the unions of, of uh, women health care workers and women teachers. Uh, it uh, ran up against a wall. We would have had to stop the highways or... Uh, blocked the tunnel that allowed the legislators to go from the the street into the into the capitol, and nobody was was really willing to do that. So uh, people let, were left flat in, in many ways, and they uh, sort of gave in, throwing the two in the towel, and and voted for Trump out of great bitterness. I uh, numbers of them are coming back, but th the truth is that the. Republicans in the white flight areas, it was something you, you would know very well from, from Chicago, the Republicans in the white flight areas around uh, around Milwaukee are, are the most right-wing people you could imagine, and the evangelical networks have them uh, as a voting machine that, that is difficult to defeat. You just described uh, thousands of areas throughout the upper Midwest and Rust Belt, and even beyond this area, uh, Paul. And in the future... Yep. I would like to do maybe a more in-depth interview with you about the Wisconsin uprisings because we were there with the Iraq veterans against the war. I was personally in Wisconsin for about 10 days straight sleeping in, you know, in the Capitol, sleeping on people's floors, uh, camping right. out and so forth. And I would love to right. get, I would right. love to get into that with you. I'd also right. love to Good. get in. I, I, what I'd like to do is, uh, dig a copy out of the attic of, uh, uh, it started in Wisconsin, uh, the documentary book that Mary Jo and I put together of documents, photos, poems, and stories, articles by people who were there at the time, because I, we provided a, a thoroughgoing documentation, and sadly, it started in Wisconsin was the wrong title. Maybe it was the title for the right wing in Wisconsin. Uh, but at the moment, at that moment, uh, with events across the world of uprisings, uh, we it looked like a moment when we would be able to move forward, and it turned out not to be. I also find it important, being from the Midwest, I have some, you know, there's some sort of pride that I take with us uh, being ahead of the game in terms of Occupy as well. In other words, when people revisit yep. that per, that part of history, oftentimes Wisconsin is left out and it predates Occupy by about a year. Well, that's absolutely correct. Um, let yeah. me, let me back up, Paul. So it's 19, let's get back to your history. It's 1963. Sure. You end up in San Francisco. It's the same year Kennedy is assassinated. What was your thought? You know, you're a Midwestern guy. You're coming from Champaign. You're all the way on the West coast. Now, as you said, in a city that looks nothing like Champaign, what is your, what, what is the scene like in San Francisco, 1963 Kennedy's assassinated? Where were you when that took place? And, and okay. what was your thinking when that happened? What, did it have an impact now, on you? Yes. Yes. In the, in the oddest possible way, I had a, uh, if I'd had a satchel, I've had a bag full of socialist leaflets that I was going to pass out that day at San Francisco state college, not yet San Francisco state university. And, uh, uh, and I think maybe this was the one day after the assassination and the young woman living with me said, no, I think that's not a really good idea to pass out those leaflets today. Uh, now San Francisco state state college was, uh, the blue collar alternative to, uh, to, to Berkeley and, uh, and perhaps at the same level as, as the Catholic college in San Francisco at any rate, it was a college where San Francisco, being San Francisco, was full of young radicals uh, and full of young radical teachers. It was uh, one could have predicted that there would be a, a tremendous student strike when a, a extremely right wing president was was brought in. A few years later, I wasn't there. I wasn't there after January uh, 1964, but. Uh, I think that I, as a fledgling socialist, had this idea 
that the chickens had come home to roost and that the things that the U.S. government were involved in in Cuba and, and various other places that I was just learning something about this had created a situation in which uh, absolutely crazy things could happen uh, and uh, and that uh, the dangers that had been raised very shortly before, I, I remember being going to, to University of Illinois, rushing into the the student union, the only place that you could watch uh, a television screen with 30 other people at the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And, uh, you know, it looked as if the uh, the great leaders of the world had arranged things so we were all going to be blown to smithereens, which I'd thought about and feared in high school, where, whereas my high school colleagues just brushed it off as, who cares? Or we can't do anything, so it doesn't matter. Um, I, I neglected to say that in the liberal uh, newspaper in town, which wasn't very liberal, the evening paper, I'd seen an ad for Hands Off Cuba. This would have been in 1960, and I was still in high school. So all you had to do was call a phone number or, I think, rip out a coupon, put your name on it, and uh, add a dollar if you wanted to. And that's what I did entirely spontaneously, and that was undoubtedly the first public radical act of mine. Uh, although it makes sense in terms of, of civil rights activity and, and uh, reading C. Wright Mills, who, who offered a real eye-opener in uh, uh, Listen Yankee. Where did you end up after uh, San Francisco? I know you mentioned this earlier. I apologize, Paul. But So it's 1964. It's January. You leave San Francisco. And did you say you end up back in Champaign? nothing to do if you couldn't get into Berkeley and you were a, a student far from home and running low on cash. Uh, the only thing to do was to come back to Champaign, and, and that's exactly what I did for the last uh, two years, year and a half of my undergraduate education. But it was fortuitous uh, because in the spring of 1965, there were the first national stirrings of an anti-war movement. And by sheer accident of being a loud mouth radical type, uh, uh, somebody gave me a, a ticket or a place, rather, to go on a chartered flight from uh, Champaign to Washington, D.C. for the April uh, anti-war demonstration, which uh, called by SDS, uh, which was thought to be expected to be very small, but instead turned out to be very large. Uh, and I heard the National Secretary of SDS say we must name the system, which was a quite quite an exciting moment. And then after the plane flight, there I was back in Champaign. But there were some inchoate stirrings over the summer. And then in August of 1965, just before school began, there was a, a table outside of registration, and there SDS which had folded in Champaign, it had intended to be a community organizing group uh, that failed, like almost all the other community organizing projects of SDS, but now was restarted as a campus anti-war movement. And this got some real uh, interest on campus, especially as the, the draft was in, impending on myself as well as uh, so many others. So now, uh, having been somebody with socialistic ideas and not sure what to do with them, I found uh, a, a purpose. I found a, a channel to, uh, to uh, take them usefully. But I also discovered as a socialist that talking about socialism wasn't the way to get anywhere in the U.S., that you needed to find a way to deliver a message that people could accept and, and work on themselves. And so we we had a, uh, a very fine for Champagne. There hadn't been an anti-war demonstration since 1939. We had a very good demonstration, uh, a teach-in and a, a little march, and um, nice publicity in the on the, the campus radio and various other places in the daily student newspaper. And there, there I was stuck again being a spokesperson, which I, I was probably had too much stage fright to be good at, but uh, I seemed to be the person with the loud voice. Um, and uh, we were able to make some real headway with the, uh, with the SDS chapter until I graduated in January and went for a year to graduate school at the uh, University of Connecticut, 
before being directed by my uh, teachers to go to the Valhalla of historical research, that is to say Wisconsin and this, the State Historical Society of Wisconsin, which had the treasure trove of uh, old, old left and labor and uh, civil rights movement uh, archives. No, I'm not sure if we have enough. I'm not, in fact, I know we don't have enough time to go into the details of this, but because there's so many different socialist organizing projects, progressive organizing projects today, two things you mentioned just there stuck with me. One was that the SDS had tried to do community organizing efforts, but that they failed, and then they sort of shifted to this campus anti-war network. Um, why is it that those community efforts failed? If, if you, or if you don't feel comfortable talking about that, that's fine as well. Oh. But I'm, Fine. It's fine. Our, you know, the the, the uh, drafter of the Port Huron Statement was Tom Hayden, uh, who was a magnificent organizer and had a lot of contradictions, but uh, later known in later life as Jane Fonda's husband. He um, thought that the thing to SDS to do coming out of the civil rights movement was to go into multiracial and black communities and, and poor white communities and try to organize. And the difficulty was you could only get so far until the Democratic Party would take over, whatever the, the, the project was, or to gain strength for itself. And it, it, the community organizing projects were put in the position of demanding more money from the, from the city governments. And either they got it or they didn't get it. But it, organizing among uh, unemployed uh, people it just was not sustainable. It wasn't possible to build strong organizations. It was tried very hard. It's before my time, so I'm not criticizing the people that tried to do it. It just wasn't viable. And chapters, as in Champaign, that, that formed with that uh, thing in mind had uh, dissolved, and people had gotten uh, pretty discouraged. So SDS was at a low point when uh, this anti-war movements came to campus in the founders of SDS were very surprised at this turn, uh, especially as it got more and more radicalized because they themselves had always sort of expected to work within the Democratic Party. And uh, many of those who survived and continued to write 30 or 40 years later uh, always had aspired to be in the Democratic Party and, uh, and within the field of American liberalism and kind of reverted to their college selves of aspiring young young Democrats. And I found those writers less interesting, and I haven't found them very sympathetic toward, toward uh, uh, Bernie Sanders either. I was going to mention Bernie because your point about socialism seems to make so much sense for me, someone who lives in the Rust Belt. You know, as you know, Paul, there it's a vastly different ideological world or even the sort of progressive left infrastructure that you have in a place like the Rust Belt compared to say, if you live in Brooklyn or if you live in LA or if you live in San Francisco. And so when Bernie came along, it seemed to me that this was the best opportunity uh, as a gateway to bring poor and working class people from these areas into this sort of socialist politics uh, in a way that can resonate with people who don't come from radical backgrounds, that your point about not just hammering people with the ideology or with the phrasing of socialism, but that you have to make it uh, or do it in a way um, that really connects to people's, you know, day-to-day -day lives. And I think Bernie did that so well uh, that... He, 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 you know, he handily beat uh, Hillary Clinton in the primaries in Wisconsin and then the Democratic Party of Wisconsin stole the uh, the delegates which was another one of those ferociously embittering experiences about who, who runs the Democratic Party and who has the money and so forth. And I think 95% of us, the uh, Bernie supporters, have reconciled ourselves to, to defeating Trump and, and uh, uh, voting for Biden and get other people to vote for Biden and for other Democratic candidates. But we uh, enter with a certain either reservation or a sense of the struggle that lies beyond uh, November. And that's okay. Uh, as uh, more than one person wrote, some of my, one of my old friends, uh, writers of left-wing films in Hollywood, somebody has to fight the losing battles. <laughs> and if we've been doing that all our life, we're going to go on doing it as, as long as we can. Yeah, no, we agree with that political analysis and we have been encouraging people to, I actually just signed on to a letter a couple weeks ago that was, I think the title was defeat Trump battle Biden. Um, yep. 
we we yep. we totally agree with that. the The point, your point, though, about socialism, I think, is so important because I'll, I'll just give you a little bit of my personal history. You know, when I got out of the Marine Corps and I joined the anti-war movement, I was immediately turned off by the socialist Marxist groups because they would just show up to our events with newspapers, give their one or two sort of political lines, um, and then that would be it. You know, or they would badger people with like all these this lingo and and history that nobody else understood. I mean, we're talking about a lot of like working class guys coming out of the military for the first time in their lives becoming politicized. And some of that stuff really turned people off. Over the years, however, I've been really happy to see groups like Jacobin, uh, the DSA, the Bernie campaign. All of that has made it, I think, much easier for those of us who don't operate always on a college campus or within a sort of social cultural bubble of the left, that things like Jacobin, DSA, Bernie Sanders have allowed us to have these conversations in places like Michigan city, Indiana, where before we couldn't have those conversations. Yep. 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 Now the irony for me, uh, I wouldn't call it a bitter irony, but it's uh, a little sad irony is that in a sense, uh, my magazine, radical America, a, uh, a magazine for SDS and for the wider new left started out in in an analogous place to Jacobin. That is uh, not much cash, uh, a lot of enthusiasm from young people, and uh, with a very specific title, a Radical America, to try to bring the, the left home to the history and culture and politics and everything else of, of uh, our USA. And uh, we seem to do very well. The most exciting years were certainly, so the former editors say, along with me until... 1967 and 1973, and then we ran up against the stone wall, was that the new left, the anti-war movement, the things that we thought were coming out, uh, such as the spreading struggles of uh, of strikes uh, in uh, all kinds of newer areas, uh, then turned back by union bureaucrats, but also by the factory shutdowns. Uh, all those things really uh, seem to come to an end at, at an early point in our radicalism and my idea of carrying this magazine into uh, wider and wider venues uh, really uh, stopped. And it's not that I'm envious of Jacobin. I'm enormously admiring uh, of Jacobin. But uh, Bhaskar and and the people he works with have a magnificent opportunity, not at all to underrate what they've been able to do themselves through their inventiveness and fundraising and everything else. But we, uh, back then had an idea of doing uh, many more things of which my magazine was part and we just were not able to do them. What, what sort of, if and I don't want to go through history that, that might, you know, upset you in terms of things that didn't maybe work out the way that you wanted to. I know I have plenty of projects that I've been involved with over the years that I don't like to revisit sometimes because it is, it is somewhat heartbreaking, but I think it's important to learn those lessons. So in other words, when you started, sure. the media landscape was so different. I mean, even thinking of your childhood history, um, the ability to go to the local corner store and buy a 35 cent magazine that, that, and especially, you know, the, there's another line I would like to go down with that because you're obviously very much interested in graphic novels. You talked about how those played a role for you. I think a lot of the people I've met who've grown up in the Midwest or in these smaller towns and places, those magazines, those sci-fi stories, those fantasy stories, um, cartoons, culture, art, it allows you to escape those places. It allows you to sort of broaden your horizons, your imagination, and what you can think about and ideas. And they play a central role, uh, I think, to a lot of people. message from the outside world. Yeah. Yeah. It really was. Uh, it was uh, uh, sort of like on... Uh, Sunday nights in uh, Champaign, you could pick up this radio station from Texas that uh, had uh, black soul music. Uh, I'm sorry, Saturdays it was black soul music, and uh, Sundays it was uh, black religious music. And uh, boy, and I don't 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 even know if this stuff existed in local uh, uh, music stores, such as there were local music stores. Um, and then in 1961, perhaps, the first uh, LP, long play record store opened in town. And suddenly you could go in and for three bucks, uh, you could have uh, find a Muddy Waters album or uh, Woody Guthrie albums. This is like a whole 
world from the outside. And uh, just about the same year, the second run movie theater in town uh, became the art theater and was showing Ingmar Bergman films. Uh, wow. wow. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't imagine. These were things that seemed like from a, another cosmos. Uh, Ken Loach's first film, The Kitchen, which was described on the outside poster of the theater as a socialist shocker. I don't think I've seen the word socialist before. Uh, it's a, a <laughs> great early film of people, were, ordinary people working in the kitchen in Britain, and at the end of it, there's a strike. But it basically, basically was showing the misery in this hot, terrible working condition. Um, so the world for us was really uh, breaking the isolation, but not so as you would know with your uh, parents or uh, with your high school classmates by and large. It was something that was uh, chosen by you and, and a few oddball friends uh, as a sort of aficionados in the same way that Lenny Bruce records were appealing to you and your oddball friends. Uh, but not to, not to many people beyond. Yeah. So getting back, let's go back to your history again. It's 1966, 67. You're in Connecticut. Um, you you come back to Champagne. You're you, did you operate the magazine out of Champagne for those six years to 73, Paul? No, no, no. I, I headed out of uh, Champagne in 19 January 1964. No, I'm sorry, January 1965, and uh, two Januarys later, January 1967, from Stores, Connecticut, uh, I was greatly in touch with the Radical Education Project, which had just been set up by Students for a Democratic Society, more or less to get graduate students to provide educational materials for undergraduates. Uh, and so I launched this uh, one single issue of a magazine, very crude, crudely produced. Uh, and by September, I was already in Madison and found a group of people who were willing to uh, work with me, get it printed, single sheet press. We'd fold, uh, collate, fold, and staple and send them out eight, uh, six times a year. Enormous task. Uh, to subscribers and others, and uh, uh, that Madison location made Radical America a, a, a real viable possibility, and it was understandable or, or proper it would be in the heartland of Robert La Follette and the history of, of anti-war sentiment that was part of this, the left socialist movement, but really was wider than the left socialist movement, and we could tell around ourselves, that uh, there were places in Wisconsin that had been adamantly against U.S. entry in the, into the First World War and sort of retained a, an old uh, a German Central American anti-war sentiment over all this time. So it was a, a, a good place for the magazine, and it was a, a splendid period to be on campus, especially that campus. Uh, because there was an anti-war uh, uprising almost every semester and, and uh, strikes that lasted for a whole week and wonderful opportunities for graduate students to go into dorms with the, the underground newspaper, which is very good, call Connections, to go into those dorms and make those copies available and give talks to young people who had heard nothing about politics in their life so far but uh, were eager to hear about the anti-war movement, hated the war already, and uh, wanted to figure out what they could do, but also, as young people in that 60s moment, had the feeling that young people could change society, could change American society. Uh, uh, and that made them the best students they ever had, but also it made them self-confident in the way that young people from the middle 70s, or let's say the, the Reagan years onward, ha haven't been uh, confident or determined until the very recent period, uh, really, uh, probably since Occupy, where young people again feel the situation is so urgent and dreadful that they must take action. They can't depend on older people to take action for them. And that psychological factor is, is very great and encourages people to go out and learn things that they didn't know about. And uh, and hopefully also to uh, to take actions. Now, when Radical America is in 
uh, publication that's 67 to 73, I think you mentioned. That's right. And then it continues on. I leave the board, but it continues on until 1999. And it oh, wow. is digi- digitized. Anyone who's interested can read the entire run on the web. And likewise digitized is my left, my next magazine, uh, which was quite a financial failure, but has lots of nice stuff in it called Cultural Correspondence. And that likewise is digitized. So for anybody that wants to trove through this past of producing radical ideas that might or might not interest people, uh, those things are on the web and available. Do you remember, I'm going to get up from my seat here and walk to our bookshelf at the community center. Do you remember a publication by the name of the fourth estate? Very well. There, uh, but wasn't it called the fifth estate? Or, I'm sorry, the fifth estate, Jesus. Um, we've got somebody <laughs> dropped off boxes of these. And I find it, so for people who are listening <laughs> and who might say to themselves, why in the fuck would I go back and read Cultural Correspondence of Radical America? Let me tell you some I of the... A, I have a story about the fifth estate, which I think is a good story. The Radical America was printed uh, for about three years by a, a, an anarchist uh, printing co-op in Detroit, uh, and its leading figure was Freddie, uh, F-R-E-D-Y, Freddie Perlman, a quasi-anarchist, quasi-situationist, completely unique figure in uh, American radicalism. He, d- he died young, but he, uh, he was full of absolutely great uh, ideas, and so totally cooperative and modest, you could hardly tell that he was the dynamic center of things. But his quasi-anarchist sentiments were close to the more ardently anarchist sentiments of the Fifth Estate and its fu- leading figure, Peter Werby. Now, I must confess, I've, I've found the Fifth Estate more sectarian and, and difficult and anti-Marxist and just uh, full of complaints as the decades roll along, as it continues today. But uh, what the heck, uh, it had a lot of odd ideas, and in the heat of the 1960s and 70s, it helped to open the eyes of ordinary Detroit youngsters to a lot of things, uh, probably some of them including marijuana and LSD. Sure. No, and that's in both important as well. The the um, I mean, I find going back and looking at these publications interesting because you find some of the same conversations and debates that we're having today people have had in the past and I know that we do I think on the left we do a pretty good job of interviewing and speaking with the older generation but I'm getting worried and I don't mean to sound morbid here um, but a lot of my really good friends mentors people I looked up to people that I was reading in the Marine Corps that when I was becoming politicized a lot of those folks are getting very old now um, and there doesn't or are gone or are yeah. gone and there doesn't go at, there doesn't a week doesn't pass or a month doesn't pass when I don't get another email about someone yep. on the left uh, who's no longer with us. And I think it's really, yep. really important for this new generation at this time of increased activity and organization. And and as you mentioned, I mean, really, for the first time in maybe 40 or 50 years, a new wave of young people who believe they can change the world and, and believe that it's absolutely necessary to do so. Um, that it's important that we revisit this history and talk to our, uh, you know, talk to to the elders in the movement, to people who have been around before us. I mean, in other words, sometimes I feel like we're trying to reinvent the wheel uh, when people have already, uh, to some degree, been through that. Well, you're you're playing my tune in in one important way. It was natural for me as a aspiring historian, as a history graduate student. To want to know, and uh, when when I could, to go and talk with uh, older people, older radicals. But in uh, 1975, with the new left going and me sort of casting around what I what I should do, I created the Oral History of the American Left project at, at the Labor Library at New York University, the Tamman Library, and uh, got funding for a couple of years to go around the country and interview the this specific group they paid me to interview, which was octogenarian immigrant left-wingers. And while I was in these cities taking buses and staying at the homes of friends and so forth, I was able to interview some some African Americans and and Latinos. But it was mainly uh, immigrant Jews above all uh, and uh, half a dozen other 
ethnicities, they were all publishing the last issues of what had been daily newspapers from the 1910s or 1920s on. They were all very close to the end of their work, but they spent all their work on this. They'd been through glorious periods of uh, struggle uh, in the 1920s, 1930s, and 1940s especially, and had determinedly hung on to their beliefs, even when they became utterly disillusioned with the Soviet Union, they still could see that the global South was rising up and that they had to be in, in touch and be part of a, a world movement. They uh, would not, uh, to the last day, give up their faith. And it's sort of important that they would not give up their particular ethnic identity either. I was thinking of being in, in Miami Beach among a group of people who were still close to the Communist Party. They were all 85 years old uh, ladies. Uh, and uh, they had a literary group, partly to keep Yiddish alive, Yiddish language and Yiddish culture alive. And they only had, I was told, two rules. One was you couldn't talk about your pains, uh, which everybody had. And the second was you had to bring in some fresh ideas, something you had just thought of that hadn't been discussed before, which couldn't have been easy for 85-year-olds. Uh, and the other old-timers that I uh, met, uh, they recounted these uh, labor struggles, newspapers that they created, cultural groups they created, uh, interracial uh, activist groups that they've been part of. And uh, it was just a saga of a, a lifetime of, uh, of activity, which continued in the face of their children and grandchildren being indifferent to what they'd done. The thing that, oh, gosh, if grandma and grandpa had done, made more money, we'd all be happier. And lots of other difficulties in life. These uh, old Jews had been blacklisted in 1920 as communists and blacklisted in 1950 as left-wingers, and they called themselves the fortunate generation because they remained, fr remained friends with each other and they remained determined in the struggle together. And, and that's a way for people my age to look at things now. And that tradition of oral histories, I think, is so important today. I mean, I know in our email back and forth, you're like, hey, why in the hell would someone want to listen to me for more than 60 minutes? But one of the things we're trying to do with this program, Paul, is to do long-form conversations with people um, because so many, so much of what we see on the internet today is like five minute clips, 30 second clips, 15 minute analyses. Yeah. And th I think there's something to be said for really long form, deep dive conversations and, and oral histories. And I, and, and somebody you know, must want to hear them. Uh, I want to use this moment to mention the book that's appearing next week, uh, 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 A Ballad of an American, a graphic biography of Paul Robeson. I put the project oh, together. Wow. But I got to say that the script and the art belongs to one of the founders of, of Women's Underground Comics 50 years ago, Sharon Rudolph. And I came to this project, I created this project because uh, when I was a, uh, a young radical, I heard a Paul Robeson song for the first time. Uh, if you had been 20 years older than me and living in New York and had left-wing relatives, you would have heard Paul Robeson sing live. Uh, or in a summer camp, uh, if not in uh, Madison Square Garden in the 1950s, when he was more or less banned, the most popular, one of the most popular singers in 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 America, uh, his Ballad of an American during World War II was more popular uh, than uh, I uh, than God Bless America by Kate Smith, and was the opposite message. Uh, and uh, everything was taken away from him. He couldn't perform in public anymore. He couldn't travel abroad to have uh, all of the Europeans and Asians and Africans who, who wanted to hear him sing. Uh, but uh, some of his songs are right there on YouTube, and people can listen to them uh, for themselves, and they'll get a chance to see what somebody could do within mainstream American culture till they were banned to uh, reach out and build multiracial coalitions, but also achieve extraordinary things uh, as an artist. So uh, this is a, a way, this is a, an evocation of Black Lives Matter, I suppose. Paul Robeson's life matters as much as, uh, as uh, Muhammad Ali's life, or Joe Lewis's life, and a lot of other lives, uh, and uh, has a, a resonance now, perhaps, that it hasn't had for a long time. And that voice, unbelievable. 
Um, he, he seems to have made the, the quote-unquote Negro spiritual into a legitimate, recognized American part of the, the great American musical tradition. That alone would be incredibly fabulous. But one of the things you can see on YouTube is him singing to a group of, of British miners uh, in 1949, and how, how he was devoted to them and them to him. It really is one of these uh, five-minute clips that brings tears to the eyes because you could see all the possibilities that were there and got crushed in the Cold War. One of uh, Norman Finkelstein's heroes as well. I remember when I interviewed yeah, uh, Finkelstein, he went on and on about ropes, and I had to get him back to talking about Gandhi uh, because he just <laughs> wanted to keep talking about ropes. And, um Let's do this, actually. We're almost to an hour, and I feel like this would be a nice point to maybe stop today. I don't know how often you mind me bothering you, meaning if you don't mind me sending you a message once every few weeks sure. or once a month, would that be a problem for you, Paul? Yep. Very good. Okay. Very good. Cool. And you don't mind doing more of these? N- not at all. Okay. I hope it wasn't too uh, boring Not for at you. all. Okay. Just fine. It's just fine. Good. All right. Well, we appreciate it, Paul. I appreciate your time and thank you. Very good. Catch you later. Bye-bye. All right. Take care, Paul. Hey, thank you for watching and listening. If you think this program is worth a pack of cigarettes or a cheeseburger, you could become a Patreon for as little as $3 a month. The link is available at our website, parkmedia.org. That's P-A-R-C media.org. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel below, Also, you could find us on Instagram at Park Media, Facebook at Politics, Art, Roots, Culture, and you could find me on Twitter at Vince Emanuele.